Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we come to the end of our series of sermons in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth called Power Made Perfect in Weakness. When something we love is broken, we hope that it can be put back together again. In many ways, we ourselves are broken. But the good news from God is there is hope of restoration. In the final section of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he makes his last appeal for the restoration of his troubled relationship with this church. But he also points them to complete restoration in their relationship with God. In this talk, Paul Gachens takes us through the Apostles' Appeal and challenges us with three questions that help us think through the whole message of 2 Corinthians, power made perfect in weakness. But before we hear from Paul, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, to chapter 13, verse 14. Now, I'm ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you. Yet, crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent to you? I urged Titus to go to you and I sent our brother with him. Titus didn't exploit you, did he? Did we not walk in the same footsteps by the same spirit? Have you been thinking all along that we've been defending ourselves to you? We've been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord. Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance and disorder. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you and I will be grieved over many who've sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin and debauchery in which they have indulged. This will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him. Yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realise that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now, we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that we've stood the test but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. 
encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Paul. We thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. And so we ask now that you'll teach us through your word once more that we might be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Most of us would be familiar with Lego. Uh, I certainly spent hours playing with Lego as a small child. Um, I wasn't one who sort of kept to the instructions. I was more just the the creative play type person. I don't know uh, if that's your story. But did you know that you can buy grown-up Lego? You don't have to be a kid. You can buy grown-up Lego. Uh, You can buy, for example, A whole scene from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Here is a construction of Rivendell. You can buy the whole valley. You can buy a replica of the 1989 Batman film, Batmobile. Looks pretty good to some people. No one's interested. All right. All right. Let me see if I can get you with this one. Because coming in at just over 10,000 pieces you can build the Eiffel Tower and the price to match. (laughs) In a world where everything feels a little bit broken, perhaps we desire a sense of control and completeness. Like when you put that last piece in a jigsaw puzzle or you finish 10,000 pieces of Lego in the Eiffel Tower, It just puts it in its right place. When everything's a bit broken, our relationships, our politics, the environment, justice, uh, the cost of living increases, the potholes in our road increase and our bodies increase with aches and pains. But just for a moment, when that final piece is put in place, maybe it gives us a moment to breathe and to be calm. Our passage today looks at with this same sense of completeness, of restoration. Uh, not just a momentary peace, but the restoration that only God can bring to our souls. And so Paul's prayer at the end of this whole letter is that we as Christians and the Corinthian Christians might be fully restored. In other words, in a world where everything feels a bit broken... God brings restoration. And that's Paul's focus in writing to the Corinthians here. This is the conclusion that people will be right with the Lord. This word carries this sense of completeness, of everything in its right place. Not necessarily that we'll be perfect or unblemished, but that we'll be put right. And so just like Lego has all its pieces in the right place... Uh, This word is used in in different passages in the Bible. For example, in Mark 1, when the fishermen are mending their nets, when things are put back. It's used in medical terms when a broken bone is set. And so here Paul's desire is that the Corinthians are put right with God himself. And so it goes with us. Yet all the way through the letter, uh, if you've been with us uh, for, for some of the series or all of the series, there's this cloud of doubt that as the Corinthians are listening to Paul, well, maybe Paul's way is not the right way. There's a question over whether Paul's desires are indeed as pure and unselfish as he is saying. And so in, in these last couple of chapters, as we look at them today in chapters 12 and 13, uh, Paul's giving his final plea to them. He's pleading with them like his own children that indeed his desires and motives are actually pure. He's pleading with them. 
as his brothers and sisters. And he pleads with them to listen to him, to trust what he is saying is true and right, that indeed, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would be restored, that they would be made complete in him. And Michael really uh, helpfully explained last week uh, in the previous chapter that Paul's not boasting of his own achievements, he's not putting himself up there, rather he's pointing his listeners to the goodness of the Lord. And so this is the devotion of Paul. We read in chapter 12, verse 14, Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time and I will not be a burden to you. Because what I want is not your possessions, but you. After all, children shouldn't have to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Now, Paul's encouraging them, as as he has uh, in the previous chapters, to give, but to give to the suffering church in Jerusalem. But he's not doing it for himself. He's not in it for his own personal financial gain. Notice the relational language here. He's not coming just as a pastor or as an authority figure or as a leader, although he is those things. He's coming to them like a dad, uh, like a spiritual dad. And that's what he is. He planted the church and he cares for the church and he sees the church as his children and his desire is just like that as as a good father to want what's best for them, what He wants to see them flourish. And so he speaks from the heart, not from selfish motivation. Now, parents, of course, are are not always good like this. We, indeed, may not have had this experience, whether as as a parent or a grandparent or as a child. But we can understand what it's meant to be like. That a parent would do anything for their child and expect nothing in return. Paul is like a generous parent. He'd give anything. Listen to his affection and tenderness here. I will gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you. Paul's like this generous parent that would give anything. And so when he is coming to visit them, he's coming like their spiritual dad. He planted this church and he spent approximately two years in Corinth. He then later made a second visit, which he called the painful visit. He had to come back and deal with some conflict and it was really hard for him and for the church. He had to confront sin. But now he's coming a third time and his hope is that he's going to find his children repentant and joyful. He's going to find his children being obedient. And yet at the same time, he knows that the sin is still around. And he's saying, when I come to you, I don't want to have to deal with this. I don't want to have to bring judgment on you, but God's patience will eventually run out. And so as he warns them, it's not given out of power, but he's warning them out of love and devotion. He doesn't want them to continue in sin. But it's couched, and his warnings are couched in the truth that he's speaking, the very words of God. And so as we read the letter and as the Corinthians read it for the first time, it's not just Paul's opinion. It's not just, here's a a kind of good way to live. Rather, Jesus is speaking through Paul. The Corinthians, it seems, are doubting this, but Paul's emphatic. Chapter 13, verse 2 and 3 here, he says, On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. In other words, judgment is coming if you, if you don't repent. But then he says this in chapter 13, verse 3, Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. The question is, 
is this God speaking through Paul? Because if it is God speaking, then we've got to listen. And I think there's a lesson as well how we approach the New Testament and how we approach Paul's letters here. We know that even the Apostle Peter, in his writings, endorses Paul as writing scriptures, the very words of God. And if God is speaking here, will the Corinthians listen? If God is speaking here, will we listen? And Paul says that their trust in this gospel should be obvious. It should be obvious that they're listening because it'll be shown in their lives. And Paul says, perhaps you should have a little test to recognise that you've indeed responded in faith. And so we have the test for the Corinthians. Does anyone get a little nervous when I say the word test? I was in service New South Wales this week. Uh, That's the new RTA, you know, roads and traffic. Uh, I had to update some paperwork. And I was sitting there with a few thousand people waiting in line. And over to my right, kind of in that corner, were the (laughs) 16-year-olds. You know what the 16-year-olds were waiting for? They're waiting to do their L's test. (laughs) Okay, they're all looking a bit nervous. And the counter did the ding, ding, ding thing. And and this, this boy came up, obviously about 16, 17, And he was white as a ghost. (laughs) He was like, kind of like with his paper, kind of shaking, you know, to see if he'd he'd passed this test. Um, You you know the moment. If you're a parent, you've seen that. Uh, Paul's test here is not meant to convey this kind of sentiment, as if God has set up this list that we might fail. Because remember, Paul's coming here from a perspective of a dad a loving dad, and he's actually really confident of their faith. Uh, Look at the words here in verse 5 and 6 of chapter 13. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realise that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. There's this confidence of Paul that, in fact, Christ is in them. But what the Corinthians need to do is just have a little self-examination for a moment so that they might go, oh yeah, Christ is in me. And as you look through the letter, Paul will tell them things like remembering the gospel that was first spoken to them. To recognise that they have repented of their sin. To realise that Yeah, they they are in Christ and not in the world. And to look at their lives and recognise the work of God. So friends, even this morning, perhaps, if you're not sure where you stand with the Lord, to take a moment and say, well, have you repented of your sins? Did Christ die and rise again? Because if you believe those things, the promise is sure. And for those who have been Christians a bit longer, perhaps to look back at our lives and recognise the work of God. Or to remember that time when the Gospel was first spoken to us. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. He has confidence, despite his warnings, that they are indeed his brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's how he addresses them. One of the questions that does come up in this area Uh, especially in our day and age, is, well, what if we don't feel like it? (laughs) Uh, We actually had this question at a children's and youth ministry conference recently that I went to. It was on the topic of feelings and emotions. So, how how would you answer a question like this when someone says to you, I actually don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I'm a bit fearful of that because I don't feel like God's there all the time. How would you answer that? Perhaps that's a uh, a point of discussion at morning tea today. We don't have time to answer it fully. But one of the answers that I thought was very wise as as the speaker addressed this type of question is this. Asking the question is itself 
evidence of faith. I'll say that again. Asking the question itself is evidence of faith. That is, someone who's not a Christian is not thinking about whether or not they're a Christian. (laughs) Only someone who cares about what God thinks and desires to know God would even start to answer this question. Perhaps they're on the start of this journey. And I think what Paul's doing here is helping the Corinthians realise first and foremost that they are Christians, that Christ is in them and that Christ is in them because they've responded to Paul's message. They've responded to the gospel. They're not living it out perfectly. They still need to repent of their sin. But he points to Christ in his humility and weakness and Paul with that same humility and fatherly affection encourages them that he as he visits that he might find them as he would hope people in Christ and in this final section of the letter Paul returns to this aim for the Corinthians that they might be complete in Christ fully restored. And so now in verse 9, Paul picks up on this same idea of being restored. But here in verse 11, to strive for it, to take action where necessary. So in verse 11, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Now, just to be clear, Paul doesn't suddenly shift from God's grace to somehow putting the onus on the Corinthians to become right with God. They've already passed the test, they're right with God. Rather, he's pleading them to live out that grace they've already received. That is, to continue to allow God to work in you, to be restored by God, to bring you to completeness or maturity. And so here are some questions for us as we consider this passage, which picks up really on the themes throughout the letter. The first question is this, will you follow the Word or the world? Part of the issue, both in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, is that Paul recognises there's a bit too much Corinth in the Christians. That is, their danger was, they were concerned with what their city was concerned with. They were too concerned with such things as power, with influence, with wealth. And Paul turns that whole idea of power and wealth on its head and says, actually, where where true power is found, where true wealth is to be found, where true treasure is to be found, is in the Gospel of Jesus is in the weakness and suffering. And yet that weakness and suffering that appeared weak is actually the power that conquered sin. It's the power of God that brings Jesus back to life. And that treasure, where's that found? Well, it's in the hearts of the weak and broken. It's like clay jars, like those clay broken pots that appear so unimpressive. And yet, on the inside is the treasure of God. And so they don't look at the impressive power and wealth of Corinth. They look at true power found in the cross of Christ and in the weakness of Paul and in the suffering of Jesus. Will you be shaped by that gospel? Will you allow God's Spirit to work in you as Paul prays that we might encourage one another, that we might live in unity and peace and the God of love and peace will be with us in this. That's the true treasure of God's truth and God's promises. Secondly, will you follow Christ in weakness? These final few chapters are a boast, not of Paul's power, but of his weakness. And if you read uh, the earlier passage in chapter 12, Paul 
could have presented himself as this spiritually powerful, vision-wielding preacher with gifts of healing and dramatic powers. And yet he says, actually, where Christ is most seen is in my weakness. That he doesn't need to compete with a worldly sense of superiority. Rather, he shows them, as in the life and death of Jesus, God is at work even in hardship and suffering. He says in chapter 13, verse 4, pointing to Jesus himself, to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him. And that is the true power of Christ rising from the dead. What appeared weak, what appeared defeated, was for our benefit. And sometimes our faith will appear weak. And certainly in comparison to Corinth or Glenhaven or Sydney or wherever we live, our faith will appear foolish because it doesn't provide riches and power. It will certainly not prove popular. And it will certainly conflict at different times with the world we live in. But we know the truth and power found in the resurrection of Christ. I've got a bucket of old Lego when I, from when I was a kid. Uh, and it's probably worth about nothing. It's certainly not compared to the pretty Eiffel Tower set. And as you go through my Lego, some pieces are missing, some are broken. It's certainly worn out. And I still have a piece that's half melted from when I dropped it in my parents' heater. And sometimes I feel a bit like this box. And you might too. A bit broken, a bit worn out. But to be restored, to be complete, doesn't rely on our perfection, but on God using these pieces to bring about His perfect purposes. And so as we strive to uphold the gospel, we do it in weakness. We do it because we're not perfect but because God is good and powerful. And we know, as Paul prays here, that the God of love and peace will be with us. Will you follow Christ in weakness? And thirdly, is God's grace sufficient for you? Paul prays earlier in chapter 12 about his own personal struggles. And he was answered by God in chapter 12, verse 9, when God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. Is that what we strive for? To know God and His goodness? To know that although we don't deserve His favour and we're a bit broken, God generously gives to us all. And so Paul's prayer is a prayer for us as well as we close today and as we close this series in 2 Corinthians from chapter 13, verse 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.